Well, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me to our Old Testament reading, which is found in the book of Psalms. That's right in the middle of the Bible. And we're going to read the 111th Psalm together. So that's Psalm 111. And we'll read this together. And the psalmist wrote this. He said, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honorable and glorious and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He has given food to those who fear him, and he will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to his people he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Amen. Well, I did just before uh, we set off, I just squiggled down a few thoughts really. Um, concerning harvest. So if these seem a little bit unprepared, I'm sorry because they were a little bit last minute. But on a harvest Thanksgiving service, what is the point of this service? Why does the church come together to thank God for all the produce, which examples we have here? What is it all about? And it got me thinking really, we live in a really privileged age. Food is readily available to us. Um, if you cast your minds back to COVID and there were slight scarcities on a shelf, we only really remember that because that was exceptional. These things don't often happen to us. But in times past, maybe even as much as 100 years ago, people were far more aware of the importance of harvest. And a poor harvest could mean hardship through the winter. It could mean actually life or death. If there wasn't enough food for you to eat, then you could, if there was no support from anyone else, die of starvation. So giving thanks to God for a harvest was something that people did. And the harvest was something that had to be worked for. Uh, nearly everybody, probably 200 years ago now, was involved in some form of farming, subsistence farming, farming to feed the family. And it was hard work. The children would be in the fields, be working from dawn till dusk. It was manual. There wasn't all the hydraulics and the machinery that make our life so much easier today. And so people were far more aware of the precarious nature maybe of life or death. But even today, we still have a reason to give thanks to God because you may notice in the mainstream media or even what children are taught in schools, there's a lot of fear in what man thinks as they look forward to. There's a fear of a global catastrophe that the earth is going to warm up or cool down. It changes according to what people believe through climate change. There was a headline the other year, which as a farmer, I guess I had to take note of because it said there's only 60 more harvests left until we won't be able to grow anything anymore. Soil will be degraded, all the nutrients will be washed away um, and that's it, we're gonna be in trouble. And if you think on these things, it can cause you to worry a lot. But the reason God's word is so precious to us is God speaks to us and he makes promises to us. And there's one particular promise I want to draw your attention to in the book of Genesis and chapter 8 and verse 22. It was a promise that God gave to a man called Noah. He just flooded the world in judgment and Noah and his family had been saved from the flood in a big ark. And... Then we're told the flood waters receded, the earth dried up again, and God spoke to Noah and he says, I'm going to make a promise with you. And in Genesis 8, verse 22, we have the promise. 
While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. God has promised us that there will always be a time for harvest. There will always be a summer season. There's always going to be a winter season. There will be rain. There will be sunshine, perhaps not in the amounts we want, perhaps not when we want it. But God has promised us that this earth will continue with seasons. There will be order and structure. So I just want you really to focus upon maybe our perspective of the world. We hear all these things, but God's word says that these seasons will endure. And in some ways, we are spared from so much worry. We don't have to worry about the climate making it unviable for humans to live. We don't have to worry about the harvest ever completely failing worldwide. Because God has promised us that he will always provide for us while the earth remains. And those are just a few thoughts I had on harvest. Well, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to turn with me back to Numbers 11. And my text is really to be found from verse 4 to 6 of Numbers 11. And we're going to consider this history this history that God has given us, whereby we may learn important spiritual lessons and principles about the people of God, how they should be as we look at this warning from history. And we've already sort of thought about our Harvest Thanksgiving service is one of those occasions where quite naturally we're drawn to looking at what God gives us and the importance of having a thankful heart for it. And we can just see as we look at this table, the great variety of things that he's given us. We've got onions, we've got apples, we've got carrots, we've got flowers, we've got beans, we've got all sorts of things that God gives us, different tastes, colours and textures. If you have children, one of the first things you really try and teach them once they're able to understand, be thankful. You're all the time saying please and thank you to them, showing them that they are to understand and acknowledge where things have come from and to be grateful for them. And the reason we do this is because when you meet someone who is unthankful, you meet someone who is often selfish and expectant. And when you meet a person who is selfish, expectant and unthankful, there's nothing that quite sticks in the back of your throat and winds you up as a person who is so ungrateful for what they have. And such people, I'm sure we all meet them in life, they spend a great deal of their life complaining and expressing a certain degree of entitlement about what they expect to have in life. And so that's why we ask and that's why we train up our children to be thankful, because we don't want them to be like that. And so this morning, what I'd like to do, maybe it's slightly different from a normal harvest message, is to look at the danger of being unthankful. Why? The Bible warns us that we are to be grateful to God, why we need to be thankful for what he has done, and what happens if we're defiant against God or if we don't have that gratefulness towards him. And this passage really helps us do this because the ultimate danger of unthankfulness is it leads us to be disconnected entirely from God and it leads him to pouring out his wrath upon us. This is what happened in Numbers 11. The people were ungrateful to God and God judged them. So we're going to learn some lessons from these children of Israel. And as we come to look at Numbers 11 together, if you just glance back at the previous chapter, we find the context and background for where we're picking up the narrative. We're told in chapter 10 and verse 12 to 13 that the people of Israel, they set out from the wilderness of Sinai on their journeys. And we're told the clouds settled down in the wilderness of Paran. So they set out for the first time according to the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. So until this point, the nation of Israel had been camped in the wilderness by Mount Sinai. Now I'm sure you're aware that Mount Sinai was where the Lord God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. The nation was given the law of God. And they'd been camped around that mountain for quite a while now. But God had said... It's time for you to move on and you're to move towards that promised land I've given you. Previously, they'd moved from the slavery of Egypt to Sinai, where God gave them the law. 
Now God was saying, I've given you the law and I'm going to move you to that land where there is plenty. That land and that place where I have promised you um, milk and honey and my goodness will be with you there. Chapter 11 is the Israelites setting off on the second half of this journey. And we're told, interestingly, what happens almost straight away as soon as they moved is that two cases of dissatisfaction broke out amongst the people. And that's the first thing I want to look with you this morning, the danger of dissatisfaction. If you look at verse 1 to 3 of Numbers 11, we're told little about what happened, but we're told the people complained in verse 1, and it displeased the Lord, for he heard it, and his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned amongst them and consumed some on the outskirts of the camp. We're not told why they were dissatisfied. We're not told um, what they were dissatisfied about. All we know is that they had barely started walking towards the promised land and already they were complaining and moaning against God and to his servant Moses. So that was the first incident. And the Lord judged them. But no sooner had the judgment ceased as Moses prayed for them and asked the Lord to spare them, we're told in verses 4 to 6 that another incident of dissatisfaction occurred amongst the people. And this is what I'd like to look at with you this morning in more detail. I'll just read verses 4 to 6 uh, to you again. We're told the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up. There is nothing except this manna before our eyes. We're told that the mixed multitude who were amongst them became unsettled and entered into a state of hysteria and great distress. Now, you might be wondering who the mixed multitude were. Well, when the Israelites left Egypt, we're told some Egyptians came with them. So they would have been made up of people perhaps of slightly differing nationalities on the outskirts of the camp. But so distressed were they that they brought the whole of Israel, the rest of the camp, into this state of unrest and dissatisfaction. If you look at verse 4, we're told the people, of the children rather, of Israel wept again. And we're given further details. Their weeping and their unhappiness were so intense that they became physically ill from it. They said, now our whole being is dried up. And of course, we know today that this is really possible, don't we? A person through such a state of um, depression and upset and anxiety can make themselves ill. There's a verse in Proverbs 17 I always think of. When I reflect upon this, it says, um, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. When a person is really grieving, really upset, it can have a massive toil on their physical health. And these people were so upset, so unhappy, that it took effect upon their physical state. But let's just take a moment to step back and look at their situation objectively. What have these people been through in recent times? Well, these people had witnessed some of the most miraculous and wondrous events that have ever been recorded in the Bible. We're told that God had taken them out of the slavery of Egypt, out of the place where they were oppressed and treated cruelly, where they were whipped and worked to death, God had taken them out of Egypt and he had done so by displaying his power to the Pharaoh with the ten plagues. They had witnessed those ten miracles. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 35 to 36, we're reminded that they didn't leave Egypt as slaves with nothing. They came out with the wealth of Egypt. God had said to them they were to ask the Egyptians for articles of silver and of gold and of clothing and God gave them favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so the Egyptians granted them what they requested. And it says in Exodus 12, verse 36, thus they plundered the Egyptians. They left Egypt with gold, silver, clothing, and abundance of physical possessions. 
but that wasn't all that they'd seen and experienced. They came to the Red Sea. God parted it so they could walk over it. And then God closed the Red Sea again and drowned the mighty Egyptian army that was seeking to bring them back into slavery. We thought at the beginning how God had given the commandments. Um, he had given them the law. He'd ordered and shaped them into a nation. Remember, these people were slaves. They had no idea how to set up a nation, really. It was all new to them, and God had helped them. He'd led them with a pillar of cloud and fire, so they knew where to walk through the wilderness. And as verse 7 of our chapter tells us, he'd given them manna from heaven, and he'd given them water when they cried out for thirst in the desert. So these people had never been hungry or thirsty. And all these things had happened only in the last two to three years. They had repeatedly witnessed God intervening in a miraculous way. They'd repeatedly seen how God could provide for them. And what happens when we get to Numbers 11? All this seems to have slipped in their minds. They were just full of self-sympathy and ingratitude towards God. Now, I think we have to be fair here. These people were in a harsh environment. The wilderness environment, it would have been lots of steep hills with jagged rocks and vicious plants that could grow there. It was difficult. It was hot. And although we haven't really had a summer this year, I think I can still remember that 40 degree heat we had two years ago. I had to work in that and I can still remember the struggle that day was. It was difficult to do even the most basic of things. So put yourself in the position of these Israelites. Every day they had to march through this difficult environment and this heat and energy sapping um, place. These were testing times for the people. But if we just focus on their hardships and difficulties, we're forgetting the whole story, aren't we? Matthew Henry, he expressed these thoughts. He said, amidst all their difficulties, their camp remained guarded, they were guided, and they were graced by the presence of God and his provisions. And Moses said this, he said, your garments or your clothes didn't wear out, and neither did your feet swell these 40 years. So although they had difficulties, they still had many blessings. So the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Where did this spirit of ingratitude and dissatisfaction towards God come from? And that's where the Bible quite clearly gives us an answer, because it tells us that such an attitude is the product of sin. And that sin is found within each and every one of us. You see, one of Satan's chief ambitions, and his most common forms of attack, is to use dissatisfaction to drive a wedge between God and ourselves. And Satan does this by enticing us to believe that God is keeping something from us, something that if he gave us, we would be fully satisfied and content with. And I'm going to prove this to you with an example. I remember it was listening to Lloyd-Jones preach. It will never, ever escape me with this example because it was so powerful in many ways. But in Genesis chapter 1, he shows you exactly how Satan does this. We can see it in the fall of man. Because we're told when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. Everything was very good. And Adam and Eve, they existed in the paradise of the Garden of Eden. They spent their days in complete happiness, farming, looking after nature, and fellowshipping, and knowing God. But then we come to Genesis 3 and chapter 1. And this is when mankind fell into sin. And we read how the devil, who was, came in the form of a snake and tempted Eve. And all he said to her was this. He said, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree from the garden? He didn't tell her to do anything. He just put this thought in her head. Did she really think that life was good enough for her now? Was she really truly happy or did she desire to know what God knew? Didn't she desire actually to be like God? Can you see how Satan planted the seed in her mind? You've got all this. You're happy now. But if you just had that, if you could just be like God, you would be even happier. And we sadly know that the more Eve thought about it, the more she became unhappy, the more she started to feel unfulfilled, and the more she started to think that God was depriving her. 
And we know what happens next. Because of this seed that had been planted in her mind, she chose, along with Adam, to eat the forbidden fruit. And sin came into the world. They were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And here we see the sadness of why humanity is now in the state it's in now. Rather than knowing God and being able to fellowship with a God who is so pure and holy and good, God cannot have anything to do with sinful people. And so he threw them out of the garden and we're told thorns, thistles, pain and death entered into the world at that moment. And this sin, it wasn't just Adam and Eve who it was found in. We're told it's found within all of us. In Romans chapter 5, and verse 12, it says this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, thus death spread to all men, men because all have sinned. The Israelites' problem wasn't actually from outside the camp. It wasn't due to the environment they were in. The trouble began within the camp. The trouble and the problem they had was from within the side themselves. Just as it may be a bit of an aside here, it's this time of year that there's a lot of Halloween activity going on, isn't there? And one of the greatest things that Halloween, one of the greatest deceptions and evilness of Halloween is the thought that evil is outside. All these witches and wizards and gremlins, these things of darkness, they're external forces seeking to unsettle you. The Bible tells us that evil comes from within our own hearts. We're to look in to see the sin. It's not always out there. Well, as I say, the problem in the camp, it wasn't from outside. It was from within the hearts of the people. And don't we know how people love to blame their environments and their circumstances for what their actions lead them to do? And this is actually the deceit of sin. When we believe that, when we forsake God, when we think that he's holding something from us, we're always going to be left restless and dissatisfied. James, in his writings to the early church, James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15, he said this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. For each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It's vital we understand how Satan draws people into believing God does not care about them. Just consider how Satan even tried to do it with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We're told as he was fasting in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, Satan came to Jesus and when he was hungry and he said to him, if you're the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Can you see the temptation and the implication? Surely God doesn't want you to be hungry. Surely God doesn't want you to do without. Therefore do this. Therefore sin. Satan loves to put the seed of sin into our mind. And if we don't check it, it begins to dominate us and lead us to dissatisfaction with God over whatever issue he puts in our mind. And when we're disrupted from thinking about God's character seriously, it, when we're disrupted from thinking about his provision for us and what he has done for us, then Satan achieves what he has set out to do. And it leads to the desire of earthly things. And that's the second thing I'd like to look at with you. Disrupting a person's thoughts on God leads to desire of earthly things. Just look at verse 4 and 5 together again. What was causing the people to be so upset? It was fish, melons, leeks, cucumbers, onions, and garlics. All very sensual things, really. You can imagine the juices and the smells for yourself. And these were the things that the Israelites had eaten freely of as slaves in Egypt. But they could no longer eat these things. But their minds were now looking back to Egypt, looking back to when they'd been in captivity. The fish that they'd eaten from the River Nile, 
the melons, the onions and the leeks, the cucumber, the garlics. I love all those things. But in the context of this situation, in Egypt, that's what slaves ate. The free people ate meat. The slaves ate those things. And the promised land that they were journeying towards, God had promised them much better. He said it's a land overflowing with milk and honey, overflowing with luxurious foods, grapes and clusters of grapes, land that would easily grow whatever. These people, though, they were looking back to Egypt. They weren't looking forward to God's promised land. And it's really helpful to understand that in the Bible, Egypt is always used as a spiritual picture to represent the things of this world and it's their abundance. So these Israelites were looking at their present situation and comparing it with their past. And they decided we're better off as slaves because we had plenty of food. They'd found their solution. All we need to go is back to Egypt and have plenty of food and everything would be better. And how irrational was their thinking? God had said, look, I want to give you so much better. I want to take you to a land which has got milk and honey. He'd led them so far, but that didn't matter in the slightest of them. All they wanted to do in their short-term thinking was go back for this food in Egypt. They'd forgotten the whippings. They'd forgotten the killings. They'd forgotten the beatings. All they wanted, they'd forgotten all the hard work. They just wanted their food now. And sin and ingratitude towards God always warps a person's thinking. Um, they had what you might call a serious case of rose-tinted glasses. And I do make this point from time to time, although I realise it's something that's happening to me now. But uh, such cases of looking back at the past and saying, weren't those days better, is often found in, well, with advancing years, isn't it? I think I'm guilty of that now. I've got to that point of view. And Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 10, do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning these things. We do have a tendency, don't we, to look back and think things were far better then. Well, this was the infatuation that the people had. They forgot the killings, the beatings, the whippings and the hardship they have. They were just living in the moment. And their solution was to look to the things of this world and forget God's promises. And so it is in the behavior of the Israelites, we have the perfect picture of the problem that sin causes within the hearts of men and women. Sin makes us think in our own situation, if only I had this, if only I had that, then I would be happy and satisfied. If only I could go to this place because that's the best place to live, I'd be happy. If only I could meet that person and marry them, I'd be happy. If I only I had this job with this much money, if only I had this education or this much power, I'd be happy. And we know as Christians, don't we, in our fallen, with our fallen flesh still, how easy it is for even us to think like this. But a person without God in their heart is always looking to the things of the world to make them happy. That's what adverts do, isn't it? If you buy this car, you'll be like this beautiful model who's always smiling and looking happy. That's what they're asking us to believe, isn't it? You can find your happiness here. And the lens that a person will go to in order to try and find contentment and happiness is massive, isn't it? In James chapter 4, we're going through James at our church in a Bible study. But in James 4 verse 1, James says this, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? In other words, James is saying of wars, fights, they come from the grasping and the grabbing of what our hearts seek. The lusts of our hearts. That what's, that's what leads to war and suffering. The attitude of, I want it now and I will have it. So we see, for example, one nation will choose to seize land from another nation to try and take their resources. They will, they're motivated by power. Daniel 7 tells us this has always been the case and this will always be the case in human history because sin leads to lusts, craving and people doing wicked things in order to have what they want. And you and I in this room, 
we're not capable of starting wars, maybe like a man like Putin is. But these selfish desires do manifest themselves on a personal scale. We're told that brother at war with brother, sister with sister. I don't need to give you any more examples. You know, and you've probably experienced being on the receiving end of such actions. You see, it's the deceit of sin that whispers in our hearts all the time, just take that, just take that earthly thing over there and you'll be happy. Well, for these Israelites, the solution to their problem, it wasn't physical. It was spiritual. And we're going to see that their greatest problem was actually that they despised God. That's where their unhappiness had come from. And that's the final thing I'd like to look at with you. Their problem wasn't the lack of food. It wasn't manna. But it was a heart that was in open rebellion against God and against what he had given them. Their grumbling against the manna was actually just really a symptom of their heart rejecting God. So if you turn with me to John chapter 6, I'm going to read from verse 30 to 35. We see the greater symbolism of this in an exchange that the Lord Jesus Christ had with the Pharisees as they referred to God providing for their forefathers with manna in the past. In John chapter 6 and verse 30 to 35, it says this. Therefore they, that is the Pharisees, said to Jesus, what sign will you perform that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven, for the bread of God rather, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. What this chapter is pointing forward to is Christ. The manna spoke of Christ, God's greatest provision for this world to deal with the biggest problem that we all have, the sin within our lives. God has provided the only solution we have to our unhappiness, which is caused by sin, in that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come into this world so that men and women can be released from the burden of their sins. The gospel, the whole of Christianity, comes to tell us that he came to take people out of the darkness and slavery of their sin and to lead them to spiritual life, to a new life, to the heavenly Jerusalem that he has promised he has gone to prepare for us, where he will make all things new and all sin and unhappiness will be taken away. And as you read through the gospel account, you see how he did this. It was done through his perfect life, his obedience unto God the Father as he went to the cross to die and suffer for the sins of his people. So I ask you this question this morning. Have you realised that your greatest need in this life is not actually more money, it's not a better job, or a partner, or whatever it may be, but your greatest need, and the only way you will ever find true happiness, is in Christ? Have you seen that for yourself? Because the tragedy we learn from Numbers 11, and the tragedy that is found many times and given in many examples throughout the Bible, is that many people reject this message and continue to seek the flesh of Egypt rather than the Lord Jesus Christ who has offered himself. Isaiah 53 puts it like this, he is despised and rejected by men. There are countless people in this world today who reject God's gospel because they look at it and they think it's bland. And it's unfulfilling in comparison with what they see with their visible eyes. The fading and the passing things of this world. The products of Vanity Fair. Perhaps as well there might be someone here this morning, a Christian who's been tempted back. The going's tough. And you look back, you think, 
I had certain happiness in sin. Well, let me remind you that true contentment can only be found by walking God's ways. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, it says, We walk by faith and not by sight. Man was made in the image of God, and man can only ever be satisfied when he knows God for himself. God has made us to enjoy his way of living, and he delights in leading us. And you will only be ever truly satisfied when you can know God for yourself. And we have these wonderful promises that he who clothes the fields with grass and feeds the birds of the air, he will supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And one day he will lead us safely home to join the heavenly throng who praise and worship and delight in all the things that he has done for us. But I realize that there might be someone here this morning who has never placed their trust in Christ. And I'd like to leave you with these thoughts from this chapter. I'd like you to consider these people. Day after day, for the next 40 years in the wilderness, they received the manna that God gave them. It never stopped coming, even though they rebelled against him. Day by day, he fed them. Despite their many complaints, and if you continue to read in the book of Numbers, you'll see how they continue to complain and rebel against him. The manna continued to come. God did not cut off their supply. And just think about how people urged King Charles to remove everything from Prince Harry and um, the Duchess of Sussex. They were attacking him all the time. They were defiant. And people were saying, just cut them off. Do away with them. God didn't do that to these people. Look how patient he was with them. Look how merciful he was to them. God is long-suffering with sinners. And you see that reflected in this passage. Each day on this earth, there are millions who live in defiance towards him. And yet they enjoy his goodness and his provision for them. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45 reminds us that he makes his son to rise on the righteous. Sorry, Matthew 5 verse 45, yeah. Uh, he makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The seasons continue. The sunshine continues, the rain continues, and the gospel offer is still open for all who will taste and see that the Lord is good. But do not despise his patience and his mercy and his long suffering. Because the reason I read those verses at the end of this chapter is we're given a warning, the warning of judgments. In verse 33, we're told of this glut of quail, a quail with small birds, that God gave these people. And uh, they caught them and were told, while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of God was aroused against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. Many people died. This was judgment of God. He gave them so much of what they craved that they vomited out. They became sick of it. And that's the fate of all that will be the fate, rather, of all who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul put it like this. He said, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who have set their mind on earthly things. Flee from the wrath to come. Look to Christ as your Saviour, for he has provided God's greatest gift of deliverance and salvation. He has given his life for our sins. Well, may the Lord help us as we reflect upon these things.